Thanks for tuning in to Bloomberg Quint. We are at the annual investor summit of JP Morgan from New Delhi. And with me, a very special guest. Needs no introduction, really, Bharat Ayer. Uh, Bharat, good having you. Thanks so much for taking the time Thank out you. and thanks for having us here. Uh, what's, what's the mood of the investor investing community been at the conference? Because all your peers that I've spoken to, mm -hmm. global, local, all you, you guys seem to be a lot more bullish than what the street might be right now. What is the investing community uh, telling you? Well, I think the investing community largely stays constructive. I mean, uh, the kind of enthusiasm we've seen for people to come and participate here has been very good. Uh, we have nine, nearly 90 companies presenting, uh, some very senior government officials presenting, and hundreds of investors. So I guess, you know, one can't really complain about sentiment at this stage. Yeah, and it was evident in the way the conversation around both the macro and micro with some of your peers went about as well. But, uh, you know, as I've seen, Sajid and, uh, uh, you know, Jahangir don't, I mean, have their own views as well. Mm -hmm. So your team, uh, while I have a single constructive view, there might be differences within certain things. How are you viewing uh, what the scenario looks like over the next 12 months, considering that crude and Saudi Arabia being comfortable above 80 is a problem. Yeah. Uh, twin deficits and the trade deficit, more importantly, at 85 is a problem. Yeah. And we are entering that election period, for which I saw you had a very interesting conversation as well yesterday. Yes. No, uh, Neeraj, I mean, uh, you know, are there cyclical headwinds? Absolutely. Which is the reason, if you'll recall, we used to be overweight on India within emerging markets for a long time. And uh, last year in the fourth quarter, we actually took India a notch down from overweight to neutral because uh, of these cyclical headwinds that you mentioned. Because as we all know, India has two key vulnerabilities, dependence on external capital, dependence on external oil. And you know, both those seem to be going up. The cost of both seems to be going up. And you know, it's difficult to really put a time frame as to you know, when we reach the top there. And also, as you mentioned, we do have a meaningful political calendar, which means lower, pol lesser policy flexibility. But that said, I guess uh, you know, there are positives too on the anvil. Uh, I think the one big positive that we see is that uh, earnings growth is recovering, coming back after a long time. We've had three or four years of very anemic earnings growth for various reasons. And this year, I think, you know, we saw the first quarter earnings growth of almost uh, high teens. And we do believe that this year, will uh, corporate India will deliver mid-teen earnings growth. So, you know, that's a reasonably powerful driver of markets. And also, again, you know, the big theme these days, obviously, is, you know, the fear around trade wars. And, you know, India being such a small part of the global supply value chain means we are relatively insulated. Mm -hmm. So the way I'd look at it is, you know, it's not a glass which is full or which is empty. It's half full. Uh, I think the structural drivers are still very much in place. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, be it demographics, be it the ability to absorb capital, be it the, uh, you know, the, the, the long list of reforms that have been implemented over the last two years. And yes, but there are cyclical headwinds, which is the reason we believe that, you know, this is again going to be, another, the next 12 months will again be a phase where, you know, returns expectations should be modest. We are looking at about 10% returns uh, for Indian equities in local currency terms. And of course, there will be attendant volatility and noise because of uh, the election calendar. Interesting. So. Uh, does this 10% uh, odd returns or whatever mm -hmm. the number would be eventually at the end of the next 12 months uh, be uh, hinging significantly on the delivery of that earnings growth? Because at 19, 20 times, we are effectively pricing in a 20% uh, Absolutely, growth. Neeraj, because uh, the way we look at it is, see, I mean, uh, uh, the hard work will here onwards have to be done by earnings. See, valuations have expanded meaningfully. Uh, we are trading at 20, 21 times forward earnings, as you mentioned. Very little scope for uh, uh, valuations to go up further. Because you know, uh, a bulk of the reforms have been announced. We see very little scope for you know big bang reforms to be announced over the next eight, ten months, given the election calendar. And on the margin, cost of capital is going up, both locally and globally, which would suggest that you know valuations, if anything, have to derate gradually. Which means the bulk of the hard work will have to be done by earnings growth, and that's where our construct of a 10% return comes in. You know, we're looking at 15% earnings growth, but we do believe that you have to keep some margin of error for valuations derating, and which is the reason we're calling for 10% uh, return from the markets. So, just before we get into the detailing, uh, Bharat, uh, just a couple of uh, thoughts on what's the mood at uh, the conference in in terms of the main tracks of discussions been as well, because mm -hmm. I saw you had an impressive array of guests, both yeah. corporate as well as otherwise. Uh, what have what have the corporates and the and the and the political circles been telling you at the conference? See, as far as the corporates are concerned, I think most of them are feeling really good because earnings is coming back. So, Neeraj, if you were to look at you know the main segments of corporate India, I think uh, consumer and consumer proxies, and I would include you know retail banks in that, 
are actually feeling good because you know uh, activity levels are bouncing back because last year you'll recall you know there was a, a substantial impact because of demonetization and the initial teething troubles associated with uh, GST implementation so you know they are having an easy base effect and you know things are coming back quite nicely for them so I think they are feeling good about life uh, as far as uh, the exporters are concerned again you know on the margin rupee depreciation is definitely helping them and you know they are feeling good uh, you know, suppliers to government priority infrastructure areas like, you know, cement, tractors, commercial vehicles, they're all seeing very robust, healthy demand. So again, this is another segment that's feeling very good. So broadly, if I were to, you know, look at the entire universe, I think about 60 to 70 percent of corporate India doesn't have much to complain about. Mm. 30 to 40 percent will always, you know, have something to complain about. You know, it's, it's never going to be uh, all the stars aligning at the same time, or that happens very rarely. Yeah, and, and that's the commentary at the conference as well. That's, that's majorly, I mean, that's largely the commentary that we've seen, that we've seen 60 to 70 percent feel quite good about their earnings outlook. That said, you know, one must appreciate that, uh, you know, when you see so much news flow about the macro, and, you know, when you see a macro scenario that is very volatile, uh, I guess, you know, there are concerns coming through mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, is this going to last? How long will this last or how well will we be able to cope with it? So, you know, it's very difficult because, you know, we're living in a very dynamic environment where a lot of things are changing on the margin and most of them are global rather than local, which makes it all the more difficult to discern. But I guess so far so good. I think, you know, people say that, you know, the current uh, macro construct, they can cope with and okay. you know they still feel good about it but if you know things deteriorate more then I guess uh, we'll have to worry about something okay uh, just two things on which I would want your view based on what is your messaging to some of the large global clients who attended this yeah. conference as well maybe there were some uh, first timers I don't, I don't know if that was the case but if they were there are always first timers they're always, first always timers on the global yeah. side okay yeah. so what have we what have they been asking you and what has been your response on two key things one is uh, this 8.2 percent number that mm -hmm. India showed in Q2 mm -hmm. and by the end of the year arguably will end up as the highest or the fastest growing economy. Are people saying that the macro concerns, the trade deficit etc. crude notwithstanding, this 8.2 and a 7.5 and number by itself uh, is a big propellant for us? See, I think investors are very enthused with an economy growing at even 7 percent plus, mm. leave alone 8 percent plus. Because, I mean, if you look at the large economies in the world, who's able to grow it at these levels? So I think, you know, from the investor perspective, you know, they're really not looking at, you know, uh, growth levels. I mean, they're not really looking for growth to be pump primed way beyond current levels. Okay. If we can continue to grow in the 7% handle and at the same time maintain macro stability, then I think that would be a very good outcome. So are those are those guys talking about wanting to put in more money at despite these valuations if indeed growth stays at about seven seven and a half? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. growth can remain at these levels without compromising macro stability. Because you know what nobody wants is you know sure can we push growth a hundred basis points higher? We can. But if that's going to come at the cost of macro stability, I don't think anyone wants that because we all know that that eventually comes back to bite. But if growth can be maintained at about the seven percent handle with macro stability being maintained, then I guess it's a very good outcome, and that's something investors would appreciate. Okay. Okay. Have anybody asked you in a detailed fashion about what happens to activity in India if indeed November, December were not to throw up uh, the outcome mm -hmm. that the market wants? See, I guess, you know, it's. A, I think people are saying that, look, it's a little too early to, you know, start uh, building in the election scenarios, uh, you know, into uh, uh, the markets. Basically, because let's face it, it's still eight to ten months for the next mm -hmm. election. It's a long way to go. And, you know, a lot can happen. And as we all know, you know, in Indian politics, I mean, you know, the real issues come to the fore uh, probably, you know, three to six months before an election. November, December, will the outcome make an impact? I think near term, yes, I mean, you know, depending on which way it goes, I mean, you know, uh, markets will react uh, along expected lines. But I don't think beyond a point anyone is going to really, you know, translate that as the result of the national election because, you know, these are three or four states. Uh, the national election is, you know, a much bigger uh, template. And also we've seen in the past that, you know, you probably do well in a state election and then you probably don't, you know, uh, repeat the performance in uh, the national election as well. Uh, you'll recall 2003 was an example, yes. right? So, I mean, we've seen that in uh, various cases. So, I think, you know, people are looking at every data point. That's, you know, with valuations at where they are. I mean, obviously every data point is going to be scrutinized, but I don't think, you know, one-sided, lopsided bets are going to be made based on uh, one result here or there. Okay. The last few days, Bharat, have shown some nervousness for the markets and arguably got to do with maybe crude, maybe the currency and, yeah. and a lot more. But just when we are trying to find some stability at those all-time highs, we've started correcting. Uh, what's your near-term outlook? 
See, our near-term outlook, Peter, just to you know, go back in terms of you know, our view on the market for this year. Uh, we started this year uh, expecting a uh, low return, high volatility year. Hmm. For what it was worth, uh, you know, we had a nifty target in the region of 11,300 to 11,500 for this year. That target got taken, out, could, got taken out over the last one month. And we've, of course, seen a lot of volatility this year. If I were to look at the next one year, as I mentioned, I think, you know, by June next year, I see the nifty at 12,500 to 12,700. By June 2019. 2019. That's the target that we have. But that said, I guess, you know, the next three months, I mean, you know, even in the report uh, that we put out in uh, late August, we said that, you know, still constructive, but base for volatility over right. the next three months. And the reason why, you know, we, we, uh, we told investors that, look, they should watch out for volatility is, you know, the event calendar is positioned accordingly. Mm. So what you have is, you know, as you mentioned, we have, uh, you know, important state elections in India. Uh, but you look outside, you also have the midterm elections in the U.S. The US. Okay. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the talks on trade wars uh, or, you know, uh, trade tensions, if I may use that term, uh, you know, uh, reaching a very critical point. Uh, also, I guess, you know, you have uh, other things like, you know, uh, we need to see the progress of the monsoon. The monsoon has been 8, 10 percent, uh, you know, uh, deficient. So we need to see the impact of that. Uh, the MSP price hikes will have to be executed. And, uh, you know, we need to see, you know, what impact it has on the fiscal and on inflation. Our house views, you'll see two rate hikes in the next three months. So we believe that, you know, the next three, uh, two, three months, I think September to November is going to be a fairly volatile phase in, as far as markets are concerned. With a downward bias? Probably with a downward bias. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me because, let's face it, over July and August, the markets went up by 11, 12 percent. So, you know, you need to digest these gains and you also have an event calendar which shows a lot of volatility. Okay. So, you know, we would say that, you know, these, the, 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 this is going to be a volatile phase for okay. the next two, three months. Okay. One thing that certainly happened in the last few days as well mm -hmm. and maybe since the start of the July series is that some of the one some of the beaten down names started moving up corporate facing banks for example made a good move uh, uh, pharma started moving up but the quality at any price argument seems to have been put out of the window or put behind because we've seen a bunch of these quality names correct the last few days the HDFC Quartet has been pummel a lot of shape. Maybe for HDFC, AMC for reasons, but otherwise as well. Mm -hmm. uh, HULs and some of the consumers from those 60 odd levels have come down to 55. Uh, what happens here in the ensuing 12 months period, if mm -hmm. your target is 12,500, do you believe this quality at any price resumes, or is there merit or scope for the lesser valued names to kind of come to mean valuation? See, Neeraj, I mean, our view is that, you know, growth will continue to outperform other value styles, uh, be okay. it uh, momentum, be it value, be it uh, quality. Uh, the reason we believe that is that, look, I mean, you know, you still have reasonable liquidity out there in the markets. Hmm. And, uh, but that said, I mean, you know, it's the reason we believe that it's going to continue to chase growth is, you know, value typically tends to perform, outperform when an economy goes from, you know, a recovery into an expansion phase. Our economies bounce back very well from the contraction to the recovery stage. Mm. But you know, for it to go from a recovery to, a, to, to an expansion stage in a very meaningful manner, and for investors to have the clarity for that, I think is going to be a little difficult until at least June next year. Because you know, you have limited policy flexibility at this point in time to pump, pump, pump growth. And you know, uh, given where oil is, given I mean, and the impact it has on monetary and fiscal policy, given the election calendar that we have, et cetera. So we believe that we are going to be in this phase. Uh, we, we, we've come from recovery. We've come from uh, contraction to recovery, but we are going to stay in the recovery stage for some time. And expansion is perhaps you know uh, second half 2000 F520 uh, mm. phenomena. So that being the case, we believe that you know growth continues to outperform. Value will have its bouts of you know uh, performance every now and then, but on a sustainable basis, growth will continue to outperform. And what does it take for value to outperform even in the current environment? Then I think you know you need to have a very meaningful correction in oil prices, hmm. because if that happens, then you know uh, your ability to push growth comes back very meaningfully, both in terms of uh, fiscal and monetary policy. But for now, we'll stick with growth stocks. Okay, okay. And, and I don't think uh, maybe coming uh, crude to come off is probably not the base case. See, our house view still is that you know fair value for oil is in the region of 65 to 70 dollars a barrel, mm -hmm. and uh, based on supply and demand mechanics. And uh, anything beyond that is uh, geopolitical risk premium. And uh, well, I mean, uh, it's anybody's call, right? In terms of you know when Actually, this premium yeah. expand, when it contracts. So I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, right now, I guess you know prices are where they are because of uh, you know uh, enhanced uh, risk premium. Okay. okay. My, My final, final question, question Bharat, and, and a call that you guys got bang on about six, nine odd months ago was on financials. 
uh, maybe you saw it coming that uh, the cost of funds would expand or otherwise, and therefore some of these stocks have now started giving off, yes. even though it was a bit of a deviated reaction. Yeah. What do you anticipate? Because it seems to be the case that the RBI hikes will be firmly on the table, if not one but two. I believe that's the house call. Our house well. views two, uh, two hikes. Two, two yeah. for calendar year, uh, yeah. the current calendar year. So what happens to financials in that scenario? See, as far as financials are concerned, see, it's two things. One is still it's a very good long-term theme. And when I talk financials, it's not just you know banks or NBFCs. It includes wealth management. It includes insurance. Okay. I mean, the whole basket. Hmm. So I guess what happens is, you know, uh, this whole uh, basket uh, looks appealing because of you know the sheer underpenetration levels that we have in the country. That said, our view since the fourth quarter of last year has been that with cost of capital going up, and it's not just local, it's global, so it's all feeding into each other, we started getting wary of you know, the wholesale funded entities. So our advice to investors has been that you know stay in financials, but mm. stay in financials which have a very good liability franchise and which have a broad-based financial uh, services presence. Okay. So that's been uh, our stance. I think it's done reasonably well so far, and we'd continue to push that. You meaning your stance is done reasonably well until now? Our stance is done reasonably well, and you know I don't see any reason to change it. Okay. Fair call. And uh, last thoughts, anything that you guys are circumspect on? Because obviously at a conference, you are showcasing the bullish themes because these are the ones that do well. What is it that you believe in your rather constructive target for the index as well, mm -hmm. as well as the economy? Is there something that is likely to underperform? See, obviously there will be pockets of underperformance. And you know, we have been uh, underweight a uh, few areas. I mean, we've been underweight uh, telecom, for example, mm. which is an area where, you know, despite, I mean, the, uh, the penetration uh, argument and the growth argument, uh, we see, you know, high levels of competitive intensity. So, you know, that's been one space that we have not been very positive about. Uh, we have been very selective in our choice of how to play the investment cycle, given the fact that we believe that it's only the priority government uh, infrastructure right. areas which will do well, and most private sector investment spending will not do very well. Uh, we have not been too constructive on you know, uh, interest rate proxies, like utilities, for example, which tend to get impacted uh, as rates go up. So yes, there are pockets that you know, we have not been positive on, and uh, you know, that stance continues. OK, great. But I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the larger tone is more of bullishness. At least it's evident in the conference. As I said, Neeraj, I mean, hmm. you know, we have to appreciate one thing. We are in a mature bull market. So, I mean, you know, your return expectations will have to be modest. And also, you'll have to contend with uh, volatility, because that does rear its head when valuations are where they are. But that said, you know, looking through the noise, and we, as I said, we believe there will be a lot of noise, uh, you know, uh, over the next course of the next year or so. We still believe that, you know, you can make about 10%. Okay, rarely does Bharat Aya talk about volatility thrice in an interaction. He's done that right now, so be bracing for that. But Bharat, so good having you. Thank you so much Thank for taking so the time much. out. And thanks for Thank having us at the conference. Thank well. you so much.